Chapter 5, Light, the Cosmic Messenger. Um, it's important to know that everything that we know from the universe, we are getting it by analyzing either the sampled return, for example, the sampled return from the moon or from comet missions or asteroids and things like that. But the majority of it we know because we study the light. Okay, the light of the stuff in the universe can tell us a lot about what history they had before. Okay, so, so our goal is to first understand what light is and what matter is and are they the same? Are they different? And how do light and matter interact? So light, when we're referring to a light, we're only referring to our daily life and we're referring to it to a very shallow or a very narrow part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And this is the visible part of the spectrum where we can see things. So everything that our eyes are sensitive to uh, is located right here about 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers. And that's the wavelength that I'm talking about. But there are other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum that they are, they are also light, but our eyes are not sensitive to. For example, your eyes are not sensitive to infrared. You cannot see the radio wavelength, right? Or X-ray. But are also there, they're also part of the electromagnetic spectrum. You're only uh, sensitive to the visible part of the um, spectrum. Now they have some features. For example, they have wavelength and wavelength is the distance between two, are there these two points, for example, that are top or the maximum amplitude or these two points that are minimum or minimum amplitude. Okay, so this is called wavelength. And you notice when you go from gamma, the wavelength is very, very small. So the distance between these two points are very, very short. Versus if you go to the radio wavelength, it's actually pretty far. Okay, so the wavelength is, uh, there's a comparison here. For example, for radio, you have a football field, 10 to the power of two or 10 meters. Okay, 100 meters or about 100 yards. Okay, so, and that's kind of a comparison. For example, for the x-ray, the, all of these spikes, these are pretty close to one another. So it's about a hydrogen atom, okay? The frequency, of, uh, on the other hand, is completely opposite. So when you have a very short wavelength, you have a very high frequency. When you have a very long wavelength, a very small frequency, okay? Again, 10 to the power of six is small compared to the rest of the frequency in the electromagnetic spectrum, okay? Now, energy is directly related to, energy of these different portions of the electromagnetic wavelength is directly related to uh, the frequency. So you have a high frequency, you have high energy, okay? So you have a low frequency, you have low energy. Okay, and so in, in terms of astronomy, when we are studying astronomy, we can definitely th see a lot of things. Uh, for example, in the sun's chromosphere, which we talk about it in chapter 11, uh, is, uh, is visible or, you know, we can see it in the ultraviolet. Sun itself is invisible, right? But there are a lot of things. For example, the cosmic microwave background in the universe, it's, it's available here in the microwave area, okay? You have some radio galaxies that we can see in with the radio. And black holes accretion uh, disk, which are uh, only uh, emitting light in the gamma and x-ray. So it depends on what we want to do. We choose a specific part of a wavelength and we study uh, astronomical objects. So this is the definition of wavelength. Um, uh, as you can see, we already have seen it before in any physics or science class, but electromagnetic wavelength is basically has an elec uh, electric and magnetic part. In other words, when we're talking about the electromagnetic wavelength, we're talking something like this. So let's say that we have a 3D of the thing. Hold on, let me, let me try to do it one more time because I didn't like this. Okay, now, 
So let's say something like that. A portion of it is electric wave, right? And let's say that electric wave oscillates back and forth along the Z direction, right? And it's going in Y direction. So this is Z, this is, let's say, Y, and this is X. So the electric wave oscillates along the Z direction, up and down, but it's also moving in, in Y direction, okay? On the other hand, you have magnetic wave that are oscillating along the x direction, but are also moving in y direction. So you have these two, and they're actually um, matching one another to some extent. So let me let me try to let me try to see if I can erase this one more time and try to see if I can draw a little bit better. Oops. Um, so, here we go. All right, my second shot. Let's see if I can draw something a little bit better. Okay, better. Now, so this part is oscillating in x direction, right? It's going back and forth in x, but it's also moving in y. So this is the definition of electromagnetic wave. It's oscillating in two directions. It's composed of two different waves, and they are both moving with the same rate along a specific direction. In this case, it's y direction. All right, so amplitude is the distance that an oscillating wave can go from the center. So if you take the center right here, okay? So this would be one amplitude up, which we showed with A, usually we showed in A in physics. So it's positive A and one amplitude down is negative A, okay? And the frequency, is the number of oscillations, okay, that the creator of these electromagnetic wave can do and can perform in every second, okay? So that's why the frequency, the unit for frequency is Hertz or HZ, which is one over second. So for example, when you're saying the 200 Hertz Okay, it means the, the source of the oscillations oscillate 200 times per second. Okay, imagine something like this, uh, where you have, <clears throat> let's do that. Let's do uh, empty a slide here and let me show something. So let's say that you have a source of oscillations, okay? that's rotating, all right? So that's oscillating, that's rotating. So let's say that there is a tiny particle that's doing that, okay? So it's rotating around a circle. Now, if you could map, if you could map the motion of this particle in Y direction, what would you see? <clears throat> What you would see is this, that as this object is moving from this point down, as this object is moving from this point all the way down and then going back up all the way to where it started, you can see its image along this Y direction goes all the way down and then goes back up again. That's what it looks like, right? So as this object here, goes around a circle, its image in Y direction comes all the way down and then goes all the way back up. All the way down, goes all the way back up. Down, up, down, up, down, up, right? So now imagine that this source that's now oscillating back and forth could also move. So it's going all the way up, 
coming back down and it's also moving, going all the way up, coming back down. It's also moving in a specific direction, right? Now, how many times per second can this source oscillate back and forth? That's the frequency of that oscillation. That's the frequency of this wave. And this is per second. For example, this particular object that's going around the circle, it does it 200 times per second. That means the frequency of these oscillations is 200 times per second. Okay, so that's, we def that's how we define the frequency. So for, for something like this, you have to know the source that's creating this type of wave, how many times it's oscillating back and forth. And that would be the frequency for that. The higher the frequency, the source has more energy, right? So the higher the frequency here, high frequency, high energy, if that makes any sense. Now, <clears throat> let's continue. So, for example, here we have a wavelength of one centimeter and a frequency of 30 gigahertz, okay? So one centimeter frequency is a specific number. Now, if you reduce that um, number, reduce the wavelength to half a centimeter, then the frequency will be doubled because you're oscillating twice as much, right? So two times 30, which is 60 gigahertz. If you, if you go down to 0.25, a quarter of a centimeter, right? So the wavelength is one over four centimeter. Now the frequency is quadrupled. So it's four times 30, which is 120 gigahertz. In other words, let's go ahead and multiply these two numbers. One times 30 wavelengths time frequency is 30 here. Let's do that here again. Half times 60 is 30. One over to four times 120 is again 30. So if you multiply wavelength and frequency, you will always get a constant number. Now, if it's the electromagnetic wave, then you'll get a speed of light. If it's not an electromagnetic wave, let's say like in this case, you'll get something like 30, right? So if, if you're talking about the electromagnetic wave or you're talking about light, if you multiply the frequency and wavelength, you will always get the speed of light. Speed of light is shown with C. It's a constant value, 300,000 kilometers per second. Frequency is F and wavelength is lambda. So if you multiply that, this is what you're gonna get. Lambda times frequency will be um, speed of light if you were talking about an electromagnetic wavelength. Now, uh, let me very quickly go ahead and show that to you. Um, this, these are also available for you if you wanna download them. <clears throat> They're not harmful or anything. So what you see here is I have all the way from gamma ray, all the way it goes to radio. So you have a different, different portion of it has a different wavelength and different frequency. So you have a frequency, let's say, let's go to, wave, uh, to visible, okay? All the way from red to purple. So frequency and wavelength, multiply them. This is the number that you're gonna get. It doesn't matter what part of the spectrum I'm talking about. The frequency and wavelength will always change in the way that their product will always give you the same number, which is the speed of light. So here, <clears throat> frequency times wavelength will always give you the same number. This number times this number will always give you three times 10 to the power eight meters per second. So it's, uh, it's a constant value. All right. Now, particles of light. Particles of light are called photons, and, and each photon has a wavelength and a frequency. So when you're looking at a specific object, celestial object in the sky, you want to know it, we are getting its photon. We're getting its uh, light, what they're emitting as photons, okay? So the energy of a photon depends on a frequency. We talked about it. Let's take a look one more time. So we know that if we, if we multiply uh, wavelength, and frequency will always get in the same number, which is the speed of light. But the photon's energy 
But the photon energy here, it purely depends on the frequency. So if you have a high frequency, you will get a high energy. High frequency, high energy. Okay, so let me very quickly go back here. The reason that gamma rays and x-rays are harmful for your body is because they're carrying more energy. The photons emitting from those are uh, exposing your body to a higher energy, right? So it's the exact same thing here. Um, photon depends directly to F or frequency. Now, what is this H? This is a constant which we call a Planck constant. So 6.6 .6 times 10 to the negative 34 joules times second root, technically photons energy. Now, <clears throat> let's take a look at this thought question. Again, pause the video, read the thought question, uh, try to answer it, and then uh, you know play the video and we'll talk about it. So um, the higher the photon energy, A, the longer its wavelength, B, the shorter its wavelength. C, energy is independent of wavelength. Well, let's take a look. So the higher the energy, the shorter wavelength. Why? Let's take a look. Now, it, so E, which is the energy, is Planck constant, which is a, just a constant value times frequency. So the higher the photon energy, the higher the frequency. Okay, so we know the frequency is high. Now let's take a look. Lambda times frequency, wavelength times frequency will always give you the speed of light. If frequency is high, your lambda should be small because you want to get a constant value every time. So the shorter the wavelength, if the frequency is high. All right. So what is matter? Matter is, um, you know, Usually atoms um, that are, are uh, you know, making everything in the universe, in other words. But it's usually a nucleus which contains uh, subatomic particles, a neutron and pro a proton. And then you have a lot of electrons depending on the atomic number that are in the clouds and going around the nucleus, okay? So now, you remember these terminologies probably from, uh, you know, uh, when you were taking a, a high school science class or, you know, any science class before or chemistry. So atomic number is a number of a proton in the nucleus, okay? But atomic mass number is not only the number of protons, but, only the, but also the number of neutrons. So, so here we have hydrogen one. So it has the atomic number of one, atomic mass number of one. So it has only one electron with it. Helium, atomic number is two, so it has two protons, but atomic mass number is four, so not only has two protons, but it also has two neutrons, okay? And it has two electrons because we know the number of protons and electrons are the same. Carbon, atomic mass number, the more stable of it is six, and the atomic, uh, sorry, the atomic number is six and the atomic mass number is 12. So these are some of the terminologies that we are all familiar with. Uh, we have isotopes, and these are the same number of protons, but different number of neutrons. For example, we have uh, carbon-13, carbon-14, carbon-12, which is the most stable form of carbon and most common forms of carbon. But there, there are also other you know, uh, forms of carbons that are available. Uh, so carbon-13s and 14s. So, they have an extra neutron associated with them. So they have six protons, but they don't have six neutrons. They have seven protons here. They have six protons, but they have eight neutrons here. So they're a little bit different. So <clears throat> how do light and matter interact? So we have different features that we're talking about usually. We have emissions, we have absorption, we have transmission, and we have reflection and scattering. Okay, so I'll, I'll talk about some of these uh, in details today. So when we're talking about reflections and scattering, a, a mirror, for example, reflect the light um, in a such a way that almost all of it is getting reflected. So almost everything that's getting incident will be, will be reflected from the mirror. 
but but some of the some of the other features don't do that. For example, in the movie screen, scatter light in all directions, and not in a specific direction, right? So you have a, a projector, and that projected uh, will will you know sh shine the light on the screen. And the point of it is that it it gets scattered to all directions. So that's why it doesn't matter where you're sitting in the in the theater. If you're sitting back here or in the front, you'll probably see the same, right? So it's because it's being uh, scattered in all directions. It's also important to, to notice that, you know, we, we have some other interactions of light and matter. So interaction between light and matter determine the, the appearance of everything around us. If you see a tree, which is uh, a green, it's because a tree is absorbing everything except green color. So it's reflecting green color for you. If you see this guy wearing a blue shirt and blue pants, it's because it, the, uh, it's being, uh, it reflects everything. It reflects blue and absorb everything else. Okay. Does that make any sense? If you see a, um, for example, this question, why is a rose red? It's so obvious the reason because the rows reflect the red light and absorb everything else. If it was, um, you know, reflecting blue, then you would see it blue or yellow or whatever, right? So it, it really depends on what it's reflecting, what, it, what it's absorbing. Okay, so let's move on with our, these are very pretty basic stuff that we're talking about light. Some of you have already are familiar with these stuff. So now these are getting a little bit more detailish and more complicated. So there are three basic type of the spectra. So when we are observing something, uh, and I'll show you a real uh, spectra of a comet that I observed a couple of years ago. So when you're looking at a spectra of an object, you have, uh, you have a continuum intensity, right? Kind of like that, continuum intensity. And there's nothing uh, disturbing it. But then you have something called emission lines, and these are the spikes in intensity. So something is adding to the intensity of the light in a, spe in a specific part of the wavelength. For example, here in the ultraviolet. And you can see that those spikes in intensity happen to see these bands, vertical bands here. You see them? All right. So uh, these are called emission lines. So there's an extra gas that's emitting and that causes a higher intensity to be observed in our spectra. But then we have also things like absorption line spectrum. That, so it was supposed to be continuous light, but something absorbed the intensity of the light here. So that's why we see these dips in intensity or these black lines. That, so part of the spectrum is missing. So we, we know little about uh, the light in this specific part of the spectrum because something is absorbing it. The same happens here, for example, where you have, you're supposed to be here, but it didn't happen. Something absorbed the intensity of light so that we see these black lines. Okay. Uh, let me very quickly go ahead and open this and uh, show these two specific things to you, okay? Okay, so, um, so we have different, different uh, spectrums of different, you know, lights and, you know, different objects. Now, for the sun, the sun is big enough that it can produce everything in the specific, in, in all wavelength, okay? So for example, in the visible part that you can see 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers, it goes in, in, in a continuous intensity that peaks around 550 or 500 ish, right? But it is essentially producing everything. Now, some of it might be a little bit less intense. Some of it might be a little bit more intense, but it can produce everything for you. But if you go to a neon lamp, you can see that it's not capable of producing everything. So it's giving you a specific part of the spectrum where it can produce some emission lines, but not everything else. So you can see that there are so many black gaps here. So uh, in other words, this is not capable of 
creating a full spectrum with a full intensity. Okay, so for example, uh, this is a blue type star, the, or, or type of stars, in other words, these are giant stars that are uh, generally very, um, very hot. And you can see that they appear to be blue. And it's obvious why, because you get more intensity of light in the blue portion of the spectrum rather than the red part of the spectrum. So this means really that it can still produce everything, continuous emission that you can see, but the problem is that it, it, it's producing more on the blue side than on the red side. So reflected sunlight from a green leaf, I would expect to have it to have intensity uh, somewhere pick around yellow or green color, which, which we can see here. Again, this is the reflected light. It does, it cannot produce uh, a full spectrum of the sun because it's reflecting. So it's absorbing a portion of it, a huge portion of the sun. Light is getting absorbed right here. We don't have anything here. But then you can see that it peaks where this green is. So that's why you see it somewhere like that. Now let me go to another slide here. Um, all right. There we go. So here, we can see the continuous spectra where you have a very hot source and the light goes through the source, okay? And you can see that based on its uh, wavelength, it can be scattered. Now you can change the temperature and see what happens. If you lower the temperature from, if you higher the temperature from low to high, you can see that it, the spectra will go to blue, okay? And if you can change the, if you can change it all the way to low, you can see that it, it still does produce everything uh, with its cap ability or capability, but it uh, would be in a less intensity. Okay. Now let's go to something like emission line, where you have a very cold gas, and the cold gas is uh, creating a specific part of the spectrum, and you can see that you can see only this specific part being emitted, because this is a cold gas. Okay. Now, if you can change the temperature, what's happening is that the position of these are not changing, but the width of these lines are changing. Okay. It means that you're getting more emission. Now, let's go to a specific example where you have a hot source. And the light of that hot source goes through the cold gas, and cold gas absorb a portion of that light but let the rest of it to transmit. So that's why you see that there are dips in intensity here because a specific portion, let's say that you have a sun, a sun here or a star here, but the, you're looking at the sun or that star through a cloud, a very cold a, a gas cloud, let's say a hydrogen cloud or a nitrogen cloud. And what's happening is that you can, um, you can, you can see the spectra, right? But there is, there are these dips in intensity because of the gas is absorbing it. If you can change the spectrum, nothing will change, right? If you change the temperature, you're still having the uh, absorption features here, but the, the, the difference is that you're, you're also creating more intensity of light. All right, let me go to our uh, PowerPoint to continue. So we talked about these two. We very briefly go, go over here. So we saw the continuous spectra uh, in the example that I just showed you. This is a, a very common uh, light that we get from stars that are uh, continuous, um, just like what we see from the sun. If you have a very uh, cold gas, and so that, uh, that can, some of these molecules can cascade from a higher energy levels to a lower energy levels, causing these emission lines or the spikes in intensity. So we can learn a lot about the composition of these molecules that are covering the, uh, you know, between the galaxies or interstellar medium, um, things like that. And then we have the absorption light in the spectrum. If you have a hot source, it's creating everything in all the uh, wavelength, but then that goes in uh, a, uh, you know, goes through a cloud of 
cold gas. So some portion of it will be absorbed by the gas, but the rest will go through. And so that's why we see these depths of intensity because this gas has absorbed some part of the spectra. And this is a real uh, spectra that we get from these, some of these objects. Well, obviously this spectra is really noisy, but what you can see here is that these dips in intensity that you see here, boom, one here, 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 these are because we have atmosphere in our way. Our own atmosphere is blocking our view. But then you have these spikes in intensity here, and we model these, and these are, for example, C286 model or methanol model. So, so it depends on what we have, what type of gas we have, uh, we can model it and realize, okay, so for what, whatever that I was looking at in the sky, whatever comet, whatever cloud, whatever it was, it had some C2H6 inside, ethane inside, it had some, some uh, ammonia or some methanol inside, excuse me, some methanol. So it, it really depends on what type of a wavelength or frequency we're looking at. And then so we can start uh, understanding what type of a gas we're dealing with here. All right, I'm going to stop here for uh, the end of part one. We'll continue with part two. Stay tuned.